If you've seen any big horror films in the last 45 years, you've probably seen a horror film that the Warrens are in some way associated with its real life story. The Haunting in Connecticut, many of the Conjuring films, the Amityville Horror, just to name a few. Ed Warren, a self-described demonologist, and Lorraine Warren, a trance medium, have both cumulatively investigated thousands of supposed hauntings over the years. But who really are these people? Both originally from Connecticut, Ed met Lorraine when he was 16, working as an usher at the Colonial Theater in Bridgeport, Connecticut. When Ed turned 17, he enlisted in the U.S. Navy, where he was quickly deployed within months of attending boot camp. At some point when he was overseas, disaster struck and his ship sank in the North Atlantic. After that event, Ed returned stateside on a 30-day survivor's leave, where he married Lorraine. Around six years later, after Ed's service in World War II, Ed started attending Perry Art School a subsidiary of Yale, from which he learned to paint. Ed would mostly paint haunted houses that he would see in Connecticut. In 1952, as an effort to make some cash off of Ed's talent, he would go on to sell these paintings at pop-up stands all over New England. Going even further than just painting the haunted houses, Ed would go up to the homeowner after he was finished painting and ask if anything had happened there in order to be invited in to investigate. I was five. Where we lived, we had an old spinster landlady who didn't like dogs or kids. Well, about a year after she died, I was upstairs in the same house, taking off my play shoes. The sun was going down and the room was getting dark. As I sat there on the floor, the closet door opened all by itself. Inside the dark closet, I saw a dot of light about the size of a firefly. In a few seconds, the light grew to human length. And then incredibly, the apparition of the landlady stood before me. She was frowning as usual, just like she looked in life. Then she vanished. Ed founded the group, the New England Society for Psychic Research in 1952. In the group's more than 50 years of existence, it has investigated thousands of hauntings. So now let's go through their most popular cases. Just a heads up. While the Warrens are not the only players directly influencing each case, they do end up playing a unique part in documenting these cases, which helps spur their career growth and allows them to profit off of them. So keep that in mind while listening. In 1970, a mother bought an antique Raggedy Ann doll as a birthday gift for her daughter, Donna, who was about to graduate from college in nursing. Soon they noticed strange occurrences with the doll. It began to move on its own first in some small ways, but later the doll would be found in different rooms, sometimes with its arms or legs crossed or even standing upright. Things escalated when Donna and Angie, Donna's roommate, discovered notes written on paper saying, help us and help Lou, in handwriting that looked like it was written by a child. Shortly after, Donna and Angie sought help from a medium who conducted a seance. The medium revealed that the doll was possessed by the spirit of Annabelle Higgins, a young girl who had died on the property where their apartment now stands. Later, Donna introduced the doll to a friend named Lou, who after being around it, believed the doll could be an evil force. It was not longer after this revelation that Lou experienced a terrifying night when he woke up unable to move, feeling the doll, Annabelle, slowly climbing up his body and then finally strangling him until he blacked out. Lou's next encounter with Annabelle was even more alarming. While he and Angie were alone in the apartment, they heard strange noises coming from Donna's room. When Lou investigated, he found the doll tossed on the floor. As he approached it, he felt a presence behind him, and suddenly he was attacked, leaving him with a claw mark on his chest. Finally convinced that the spirit in the doll was not a harmless child, Donna sought help from an Episcopal priest, Father Hegan. He contacted higher authorities, who in turn brought in Ed and Lorraine Warren. After speaking with Donna, Angie, and Lou, the Warrens concluded that the doll was not possessed, but was being manipulated by a demonic spirit. At Donna's request, the Warrens took the doll with them to prevent further occurrences. 
Ed Warren, wary of the possibility that the spirit might still be attached to the doll, decided to avoid the interstate on their drive home, and their car began to swerve and stalled dangerously at every curve. After arriving home, the Warrens placed Annabelle inside a specially built case in their occult museum. After hearing Ed Warren's account of the doll, a young man banged on Annabelle's case. On their way home, he lost control of his motorcycle and crashed into a tree, killing him instantly. Perrin Family, The Conjuring In January 1971, Carolyn and Roger Perrin and their five girls moved into a 14-room farmhouse in Harrisville, Rhode Island, where they quickly began experiencing strange occurrences. The first day they moved in, Andrea and her sisters noticed a man in the room who was allegedly not with Mr. Kenyon, Mr. Kenyon being the previous owner of the house. Andrea asked her mom, Carolyn, Mom, who is that man over there? She replied, There's no man in the other room. The man then disappeared. Carolyn Perrin and her children noticed small and settling events, like hearing movement in rooms where no one was present, a broom moving on its own, performing housework for the family, beds shaking and moving, toys or objects appearing in different places. There's also some more unbelievable occurrences, like a cylindrical tube of light unnaturally coming from the chimney, bending on a hard turn, which would then direct itself onto Carolyn's stomach, burning her. Haunted bats and haunted flies, and then noises like those of a Revolutionary War era horns calling soldiers to battle. Most notably, Carolyn and her children have seen horrible apparitions of a woman with a broken neck and a lack of facial features, and smelling horribly. The first time this occurred to Carolyn, the woman appeared floating above her where she felt paralyzed and unable to move in bed. Andrea had her appear to her in a dream where she saw her mom, Carolyn, and the ghastly woman, but couldn't move near her. A family friend reportedly saw the apparition of the broken neck lady as she was driving away after visiting with the family. The apparition is a constant force within the family's home and is believed to be the most malevolent spirit of the house. Her name is Bathsheba Sherman and was rumored to have been a Satanist involved in a child's death. One big apparition involved Carolyn waking up seeing this Bathsheba Sherman performing some sacrificial ritual in a coven with several other witches. During the 10 years the family lived in the house, the Warrens made a few visits to investigate the paranormal activity. On one occasion in 1973, Lorraine Warren conducted a seance to communicate with the spirits tormenting the family. The Warrens believed that Carolyn was possessed and that a seance was the right course of action in order to rid themselves of the demon. During the seance, Carolyn Perrin allegedly became possessed, speaking in an otherworldly language, levitating in her chair, where she was then thrown across the way into another room. Following the seance, the family endured many more hauntings throughout the years, but remained in the house due to financial troubles until they were able to finally vacate in 1980. Amityville On November 13, 1974, police officers found six members of the DeFeo family dead from gunshots to the head in their home. Ronald DeFeo Jr., the obvious suspect, denied the allegations at first, but later confessed after police found the murder weapon. He was convicted of the murders and sentenced to six consecutive life terms. On December 18, 1975, the Lutz family, George, Kathy, the husband and wife, and Missy, Christopher, and Daniel, the kids, moved into the former DeFeo home in Amityville, just 13 months after the infamous murders. On their first day, Catholic priest arrived to bless the home, Father Mancuso. When Father Mancuso started throwing holy water in the bedroom once occupied by Mark and John DeFeo, he heard an unseen masculine voice command. He quickly left, but on the way home from his drive, Mancuso found his car driving off the road, despite him keeping straight on the road. The hood suddenly flew open, breaking the windshield. The car then stalled 
Around a week later, Father Bancuso would then allegedly develop a high fever, flu-like symptoms, and blisters on his hands similar to the stigmata. Despite the priest blessing the house, the family experienced strange sensations. Their daughter Missy started spending all of her time with an imaginary friend named Jody, a red-eyed pig. This same pig is seen by George later from Missy's window outside. In another time, tracks of cloven footprints are observed by George outside in the snow. Windows are constantly being forced open on their own, as well as doors flying open out of nowhere. The house also became plagued by mysterious odors that smell like human excrement, and green slime oozed from the walls. Kathy particularly experienced several entities. She first felt the touch of a woman entity, first on her hand, and another time it would hug her tightly, and then a third time she was touched by multiple ghostly figures, causing her to pass out. Other times, people would see hooded figures and an apparition of a little boy. George repeatedly woke up at 3.15 a.m., the time of the DeFeo murders. Some of these nights, he would hear stomping sounds, like soldiers marching. George once saw Kathy transform into a 90-year-old woman, and other nights, he saw her levitate above the bed. Allegedly, one possible cause of the hauntings was because of a man named John Ketchum, who used to live within 500 feet of the Lutz's house, and apparently was into devil worship. The story goes is that he was actually forced out of Salem, Massachusetts because he was accused of witchcraft. The final night in the house was the most terrifying. Both George and Kathy's health deteriorated and tensions within the family rose. Unable to deal with it anymore, the Lutz family fled the house. Soon after the Lutz family left, Lorraine and Ed Warren arrived in their place to begin their own investigations. In addition to the Warrens, mediums, investigators, and parapsychologists simultaneously investigated the house. The research team photographed the little boy entity as he was watching them move about the house. During the investigation, Ed felt like he had been forced to the floor while praying in the basement. Lorraine felt like there was a demonic entity in the house. The Shinnecock Indians, who once had enclosure on this land, used to house the sick and the mad who were there left to die. The Warrens believed that suffering, associated with the property, left with a very negative energy, making it a magnet for demonic spirits. Arnie Johnson, The Devil Made Me Do It In 1980, 11-year-old David Glatzel began experiencing strange and frightening phenomenon. When David Glatzel was helping his sister move into her new home, he witnessed the apparition of a see-through old man who pushed him onto a bed. Soon after these initial sightings, David's behavior changed dramatically. He would wake up in the middle of the night, shouting and screaming. He reportedly would feel choking sensations and writhed in pain from invisible knife stabs. There was instances of plates floating and chairs flying through the air and objects like books being found in different places. Debbie, the eldest daughter, and the one who was dating Arnie Johnson, also reportedly would see the apparition of the man who the family dubbed the Beast. I saw a face with jagged teeth and coal black eyes. It had horns and pointed ears. David pointed out that his feet were deer-like or cloven. The family would eventually seek help from priests in order to exorcise the demons haunting the boy and the family. The priest had performed a blessing of the house and reading of prayers because no official exorcism was authorized by the diocese. David continued to suffer. Eventually, the priest recommended the Warrens. When the Warrens arrived, they did a medical examination and a question examination, which they recorded. They concluded that the boy was obsessed and possibly on his way to possession. The Warrens petitioned the local diocese for an exorcism. During these exorcisms, Lorraine claims that David levitated and even showed supernatural precognition, particularly regarding the manslaughter that Johnson would eventually commit. Arnie Johnson, who was present, allegedly taunted the demon to leave David and enter him instead. According to the Warrens, the demon left David and possessed Arnie. On February 16, 1981, Arnie Johnson and Alan Bono, his landlord, 
got into a heated argument. During the altercation, Johnson stabbed Bono multiple times with a pocket knife, leading to Bono's death. Johnson was arrested for the murder and the case quickly gained media attention. Johnson's defense attorney, Martin Manella, argued that Johnson was not responsible for his actions because he was possessed by a demon at the time of the murder. The defense intended to prove the possession by bringing in experts on the paranormal, including the Warrens. However, the judge, Robert Callahan, rejected the possession defense. Arnie Johnson was found guilty of first-degree manslaughter in November 1981. He was sentenced to 10 to 20 years in prison, but only served five before being released for good behavior. The Snedecker Family, The Haunting in Connecticut in the 1980s, the Snedecker family, consisting of parents Carmen and Al Snedecker and their children, moved into a rental house in Southington, Connecticut, unaware that the house had once been a funeral home. Soon after moving in, the family claimed to experience disturbing paranormal phenomena. Some of the reported incidents included apparitions and shadowy figures, objects moving on their own, foul odors, and the feeling of being touched by unseen entities. So, the usual suspects. At one point, Carmen and Al both claimed to have been sexually assaulted by a paranormal entity. The oldest son, Philip, who was undergoing treatment for Hodgkin's lymphoma at the time, would see a young man with long black hair all the way down to his hips. Philip eventually started having personality changes where he would become irritable and rageful he would start picking on his younger siblings as a result. At one point, Philip assaulted Tammy, his cousin, which resulted in his involuntary stay at a hospital where he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. Allegedly, the Snedecker family sent Philip to live with relatives once he was released from the hospital, where the voices and spirits ceased to be seen. However, the worst was not over for the family because the hauntings continued in the house. After the family became so desperate, they didn't know where else to turn to. They contacted Ed and Lorraine, asking for help in investigating their home. The Warrens declared the house itself to be possessed, and then asked a priest to bless the house, and later exorcise the home. Eventually, the exorcism succeeded, and the demons were delivered from the home. So now let's go ahead and talk about what's wrong with each of these stories, both individually and as a group. We will start with Annabelle, the cursed doll. But first let's talk about a different set of supposedly cursed or possessed objects, or however you want to view them. Ed Warren gives a forward in one of the earliest books about his and Lorraine's career with ghosts and demons. The book, deliver us from evil from the case files of Ed and Lorraine Warren, specifically. In this forward, Ed mentions multiple things that are wrong about supposed Egyptian cursed objects. You have probably heard some version of the story where some silly billy archaeologist mistakenly stupidly opens up the tomb of some ancient king of Egypt only to shortly thereafter die from mysterious circumstances. I'm not going to go into every instance where this ends up being mostly not true. Instead, I'll focus on what Ed says. For example, in this foreword, Ed makes a point about Britain's most famous Egyptologist, Professor Walter Brian Emery. Except, Ed mistakenly misspells the name as Amory. Ed further goes on to explain that Emery was warned not to pick up the statue of Osiris for fear of being cursed. Ed says that Emery laughed at this claim, picked it up anyway, and within seconds, his eyes rolled through the back of his head and he went into a coma to which he never awakened from. Ed further goes on to say that Emery was perfectly healthy before going on to this expedition. However, most of what he's saying is not true. Not only had Emery had reportedly been in ill health for several years, he never picked up the statue to begin with or went into a coma. In excavating in Egypt, 
the Egypt Exploration Society 1882 to 1982, there are blurbs about Emery's health and the way in which he died. In 1964, Emery returned to Saqqara to direct the society's work in the area just described, and work continued until his death in 1971. The present writer was privileged to be a member of the team every year except 1969 and had first-hand experience of Emery's unflagging enthusiasm for the arduous work, despite ill health and sundry setbacks. In Journals of Egyptian Archaeology, Volume 57, it also details Emery's poor health. In November 1967, after two years of indifferent health, he underwent a very serious surgical operation. Six weeks later, straight from convalescence, he returned to Saqqara. Emery was in constant pain, to which he would not confess. He carried on his full responsibilities as field director. Few realized that when on the mile return walk over rough desert, he stopped. He was not simply admiring the view. By the summer 1970, he had made a remarkable recovery. He went out to Saqqara in October in the best of spirits, which he maintained through a long season. On Sunday, March 7, 1971, a few days before the scheduled end of work, he was found after morning's work collapsed outside his office in camp. He was taken to the Anglo-American Hospital in Cairo, where he appeared to be recovering. But on the evening of March 9th, he suffered a second stroke. No mention of coma, no mention of anyone working with him warning not to touch a statue of Osiris. It's a complete fabrication and he was clearly not in perfect health since he was dealing with his health for a few years now. Although to be fair it does not mention what the problem is exactly, there was the mention of a serious surgical operation. So what does this have to do with Annabelle? Well I think simply most of the story is ridiculous. Are we led to believe that a doll is attempting to kill people Chucky style by army crawling up the bed? and then psychically restricting the breathing? Are we supposed to seriously believe that this possessed doll was able to legibly write anything down on a piece of paper? Ridiculous. Are we also led to believe that the doll is somehow binding its evil powers or evil spirits by a simple pane of glass? Ridiculous. If demons are real, a panel of glass is not going to prevent the spirit from escaping the doll because they live in a separate realm from us anyways. They can teleport or travel anywhere at a moment's notice. And there wasn't a priest or clergy member to bless the outside of the box, trapping the demon in the box. Are we really going to believe that a demon, whose, I guess, goal is to possess a human or lead them to evil, will just inhabit a doll with no real usefulness? It's ridiculous. By the way, I can't find anything about a motorcycle crash. Now on to the Perrin family that is depicted in the first Conjuring movie. I read Andrea Perrin's 500 page House of Darkness, House of Light volume one book. I did not attempt the others. It's a dense 500 pages with lots of filler. Additionally, there's plenty of quotes by random famous intellectual figures or writers which are sometimes like funny or ironic. In fact, she quotes Carl Sagan multiple times, despite Sagan clearly being a skeptic himself. Overall, the book written as a piece of fiction is not a terrible story. It just needs to be cut down. And I only skimmed through the other two just to get some context for the Warren's visit, which ended up being kind of unnecessary anyways. The big problem with this book, though more than anything, is that it was written nearly 40 years after the alleged hauntings were occurring. The other problem is I would have much like to see the Warrens' case files on the family, but their own writings on the website is very sparse about the case, which is disappointing. Basically what I'm trying to say is, we need an earlier version of, of events, so it's easier to see what really happened. We'll get the version of events that are the closest to reality, but instead, I'm left with Andrea Perrin's ramblings, which are just obviously not accurate. I'm sorry, but a cylindrical light making a hard turn after coming down a chimney just doesn't happen. And housework being done on its own by one of the more gentler ghosts? 
What about the Revolutionary War era ghosts who are replicating the battle calls from that time? In Bathsheba Sherman, I'm sure most people know by now that she wasn't a ritualistic Satanist carrying out innocent killings in this way, like killing her child. Dre writes about the apparition, and she kind of has this like skepticism towards her own story by acknowledging that, that she was acquitted of any murder accusation. I mean, that is what the witch trials were though, accusations of witchcraft which turned out to be BS 99% of the time. I mean, if we learned anything from the witch trials, it's that unconventional women are getting blamed for serious crimes, when in reality it's the accusers who tend to be abusive. Norma Sue Clift, who lived in the Conjuring House for 25 plus years, has never seen or heard anything unusual. But what I found interesting is that the historian actually quoted me. She said my name and then said that when I was asked, I said, there is nothing that ever happened here that couldn't have been explained by other means. And she quoted that. And that's how I had always felt. And I thought this was an also important to tell you. It also infuriates us to know that so many people believe this, our home, still contains evil or demons or believe ghosts even exist here. And neither did the family who have lived there before, according to investigations done by Jamie Rubio, who was in contact with Pam Kenyon, the granddaughter of the man who was living at the house before the parents moved in. Jamie Rubio writes on her blog, Roger claimed in a videotaped interview, on the first day, the owner said, do your family a favor, keep the lights on at night. According to Pam, that was not true at all. In fact, Pam claimed that her grandfather was a practical New Englander, and he didn't believe in anything like that. She said he had never had any experiences in the house for 47 years he lived there. And if he had said anything along the lines of keeping a light on, it was because he was an elderly man and had to keep a light on to see at night when he walked down the stairs to go to the bathroom as he could have fallen or broke a bone or worse. Additionally, the sisters, especially Andrea, noticed a man who was in the room besides Mr. Cannon when they arrived at the house. But when Pam Kenyon was asked about this, she described that if anyone else was in the house, it was most likely Earl Jr., Mr. Kenyon's son. Norma Sutcliffe found Bathsheba Sherman did not kill a child nor was there any evidence that any sort of trial had occurred for Bathsheba Sherman. It was Carolyn Perrin who created the fictitious story about Bathsheba Sherman. The question is why did she want or need to make these claims? She claimed that Bathsheba had been an Arnold. She was not. That she had lived in our home. She did not. She claimed that Bathsheba, when she was young, killed an infant with a knitting needle, and according to her, a hearing was held to see if there was enough evidence to bring her to trial for murder. No evidence of the death or of a hearing anywhere has ever been found, including the Superior Court records. Carolyn claims the community knew all about it and that the townspeople ostracized Bathsheba for actually murdering the infant for sacrifice in a satanic ritual because she was really a witch. That Bathsheba was a had made a pact with the devil. Well, we have the local historian who has spoke to us about this time. She never had that encounter, nor does she know about any records in the Japacha Historical Society or in Town Hall that had anything to do with Bathsheba Sherman. Again, it was not the seat of the time. Bathsheba was born in 1812. Burrowville was incorporated in 1806. And she did not die by hanging herself on the property, but rather by natural causes. Bathsheba did not hang herself. We have the records. Bathsheba died of a stroke in 1885. She had died in her own home of natural causes. Not only that, she never even lived on the property to begin with. So why need to fabricate such tales? She claimed extensive research. I don't think so. What she appeared to have done is read the Black Book of Burville, took any name of Arnold, and claimed the deaths happened here in our home. There has never been a suicide, murder, or drowning on our property, even beyond the parents claimed. The Warrens and other paranormal groups claim, of course, that a sudden or violent death is the cause for hauntings. Well, apparently, in all the records we went to, both in Chapachet and Burrowville and Douglas and Uxbridge and Providence, found no connection to any of these violent deaths. 
In fact, if Carolyn believed the black book, she would have seen that Bathsheba was not in the book because she died of natural causes, not from hanging herself, and no claim of a death of an infant from the knitting needles. The Black Book was a list of unusual deaths in Burville since 1797 until 1950s, and others were added up until the 1990s. Andrea claims Bathsheba's history was in Japatchen. It was not. Norma also verifies what Pam Kenyon said about the family not experiencing any hauntings on the property. Parents claimed Mr. Kenyon, who sold the house to them, did not tell them about the hauntings. Well, the Kenyon family has left letters with the historical society and with me that their home that had been in their family for 200 years has not been nor ever has been haunted. She married and had four children, and when she died, she was buried on the family plot with a funeral service by a Baptist minister. To continue the history of Bathsheba Sherman, she did not marry until age 32 to Judson Sherman. And when she died, the family decided to bury her in the family plot with her first husband, with her father and mother. Her son Herbert outlived her and married and had children of his own. He inherited the property. We have the articles referring to her funeral and will. And when we found that someone who has had a notorious history is often referred to at the time of the death in the newspapers. But no story was written referring to any past notorious history of a Bathsheba Sherman. Her funeral and burial was conducted by A. H. Granger, a Baptist minister of the First Baptist Church of Providence, well-renowned church, and also conducted its ministry for the Harrisville Baptist Church. I doubt that the Baptists would have accepted Bathsheba as a parishioner if she had been accused of witchcraft or murder or an infant uh, by satanic rituals. So what does this have to do with the Warrens? Well, Lorraine Warren was part of the push for Bathsheba Sherman being the source of the hauntings when she arrived at the parents. Andrea notes this in the book as well. Furthermore, the Conjuring film makes Bathsheba Sherman a major plot device in the film from which the secret Warren files are based off of, not Andrea Perrin's book, House of Darkness, House of Light. Overall, none of it makes sense. Why did all of the hauntings cease when the family left the home and no one else experienced anything? Why didn't they leave if it was truly exhausting and terrifying as Andrea claims in her book? Parents did claim some Christianity in the book, although they did switch churches a few times. Wouldn't they know to go see an exorcist or a priest or minister to bless the home or any of them? None of that was done. Instead, they just live in this supposed terrifying place where their mother was lifted up and thrown into another room, where a woman with a broken neck and frightening facial features was constantly terrifying them, spelling out omens of doom. The same apparition who also followed a family friend home? Nah, it's fine. This is normal. The Amityville story partially reads off like a ripoff of The Exorcist. You have this priest who gets involved with the story and later starts to get sick and fearful about his life. Also, isn't it weird that Annabelle, in addition to the Amityville horror, both have stories of demons driving cars off the road? The so-called Father Mancuso wasn't a Father Mancuso, but a Father Picararo. In a lawsuit filed by George and Kathy Lutz, the homeowners, against William Weber, the defense lawyer for Ronald DeFeo Jr., to make a long story short, the Lutzes were suing Weber and a few other entities involved because the Lutzes and Weber had made a contract for the book so they can write it and sell it. The Lutzes eventually decided to go with another author though, Jay Anson, because he gave them a larger cut of the profits. However, Weber went ahead without the Lutzes and sold their story to a newspaper in a magazine. The Lutzes did not like this, so they sued. Why am I telling you this? because the true story and the facts were revealed during this case. During this trial, Father Picararo's relationship to the case was described in an affidavit from William Daly, the Lutz's attorney. It states, Father Ralph J. Picararo has indicated that his only contact relating to this case was a telephone call from the Lutz's regarding their psychic experiences. Father Picararo 
He's also on record saying that, that he was not sure if there was any supernatural occurrences at the house. The Diocese of Rockville Center made a statement regarding the book in May 2002 when pestered about interviews about the book. They stated, The Diocese maintains that the story was a false report. In November of 1977, diocesan attorneys prepared a substantial list to be submitted to the publisher of the Amityville Horror of numerous inaccuracies, factually incorrect references, and untrue statements regarding events, persons, and occurrences that never happened. Additionally, no other owners of the house have ever experienced any hauntings after the Lutzes moved out, similar to what the parents experienced. Joe Nickel from the Skeptical Inquirer found that none of the locks, doors, hinges, and windows were in disarray, according to the homeowner, Barbara Cromarty. What about the ghost boy photo taken by one of the investigators while Ed and Lorraine were at the house? Well, many online have pointed out that there was actually another investigator there by the name of Paul Bartz. Kenny Biddle made a video analyzing the investigator Paul Bartz and the ghost boy in the photo's appearance. Kenny made a point that their appearances don't look like they match until you realize they have the same hair part. And while the clothes don't seem to match either, that is, until you realize the film is a special infrared film stock that additionally captures different spectrums of light compared to the normal black and white film, essentially giving that photo different shades of gray. People have been saying that this is the gentleman in, in the shot. And you know what? When you do it side by side like this, it really does look like him. I actually overlaid it. Um, the similar face, especially up here, the part of the hair where the hair goes off to the side here it's exactly the same it matches up perfectly and then the striped pattern for the plaid shirt matches up but it's different color like this one is lighter this one is darker so what's going on with that what's going on with that is that there's a difference between the earlier photos that night which was done with regular black and white film and then later on that night when it was set up uh, on a timer using infrared film so right here <laughs> there's a normal camera used up, up top two pictures so this is a, a color photograph that i used and i took two jackets that i have that have plaid um the plaid kind of design on it and then i switched to black and white and took a shot not much difference especially with this one on the left but when you see when you go to an ir converted camera and especially when you look the upper here upper here the normal one black and white and this one you can see how it changes from a light uh light colored pattern a more light colored plaid pattern which is what the uh what the code is to this one right here and it becomes darker so big difference so when we go back to the picture of paul bartz next to what is probably him leaning out the doorway we can see that yes the reversal of this plaid shirt is just in line it's in line with what we would expect to happen as far as the devil worshiper john ketchum well there was actually a family of ketchums that lived in and around amityville the most closely related to the description in the book is described on ancestry.familysearch.org in 1622 a man named john ketchum was born in england the family immigrated to ipswich massachusetts when he was about 20 years old he visited Salem, where he was made free via Salem's court system. It would seem he arrived here as an indentured servant. This particular John Ketchum, which would have been the John Ketchum that would have been into witchcraft, has not any links to witchcraft. Furthermore, it states, Ketchum was also a very well-known family that lived in Amityville within the 18th century. Many historical buildings were owned by them and are now museums in Amityville. Furthermore, there is also no evidence of a Shinnecock Indian site on the property of the Amityville Horror House, which Lorraine previously claimed. Eventually, it was revealed by William Weaver that the Amityville story in its entirety, minus the brutal murders, was Weaver and Lutz's horror story created over many bottles of wine. The plan was for Weber to use the story as a way to get a new trial for his client, Ronald DeFeo. 
This was despite Lorraine Warren claiming that a demonic presence still inhabited the place when they finished their last seance, when clearly nothing happened. So talking about the Devil Made Me Do It case, we have to bring up the fact that David Glatzel's depiction of the demonic or ghostly creature is just straight up a fawn from Greek mythology. When Judy Glatzel was pressed on why her son never received any psychological testing, she went into a rant about how the world is turning evil. They just want to stick needles to my kid. There's no way in hell they're going to do that. If people honestly believe in Jesus Christ our Lord, they have to believe in the devil. Besides, this world is being controlled by the devil. Look at the drugs, the prostitution, the gambling, the violence. The devil is in charge of it all. Arnie Johnson claimed he blacked out and didn't remember anything that happened during his fatal fight with Alan Bono. Well, we do know that they were drinking, and alcohol can cause you to black out and not remember anything for certain periods of time when you are intoxicated. That is far more likely to have happened than him being possessed by a demon. But what's also interesting is both in the book and in the 2023 documentary, The Devil on Trial, Carl Jr. Latzel, the brother of David, reportedly thinks the whole thing is a hoax. When some priests were walking into the Glatzel house to perform an investigation of the matter, Carl Jr. remarked, The only thing that's wrong with David is that he's mentally ill. He always has been. My mother only makes this stuff up so he doesn't have to admit it. She's crazy. I'm the only sane one. Ask anybody. In 2007, Carl Jr. filed a lawsuit against the Warrens purporting that the book The Devil in Connecticut was full of lies and that the Warrens made up a story about demons to get rich and famous. Not only that, Carl Jr. also remarks about Ed Warren and Gerald Brittle regarding the book The Devil in Connecticut. Ed said, make it scary, and Gerald goes, but I checked with the people and they said this didn't happen. Ed goes, make it scary, people come to us, they buy scary. Carl Jr. also implies in the documentary The Devil on Trial that David started exhibiting more demonic possession symptoms after the Warrens described them right in front of them. In the beginning, when the Warrens arrived, they were there every day the first week. Every night they had the cameras ready, the microphones ready. It was a show. One night when the whole charade goes on where David is screaming and cursing, Carl Sr. comes in, takes David, and disciplines him by slapping him, telling him to stop. And he did. Carl Jr. remarks. After the trial, Judy Glatzel went to Hollywood. You are going to be millionaires, Lorraine Warren told them. Actually, David himself even noted how sketchy the Warrens were. Lorraine told me I was going to be a rich little boy from having this book deal, David says in the documentary. And it was a lie. The Warrens made a lot of money off of us. If they can profit off of you, they will. At the time, the Glatzel parents received $4,500 for selling their story. The Warrens received more than $81,000. Actually, I think one of the most egregious pieces of fiction in the book is this line here. The Warrens documented the ghastly manipulations of David's body even while he was asleep. Ed explained, Lorraine and I saw David's body bloated up to deadly proportions by these forces. His head swelled up to the size of a basketball. His abdomen ballooned to three times its normal size, as did his arms and legs and even his fingers. The bloating was severe to the degree that David's body could not expand anymore and cracks developed into his skin from the swelling. It looked like David was going to explode. Carl Jr. had one theory as to what happened. Allegedly, after his mother Judy had died, he was going through her things and noticed a note that described Judy noting she had just finished giving medicine to her family. Carl Jr. thinks that she was drugging the family with somniacs, sleeping pills, and long-term side effects included irritability and hallucinations. The Haunting in Connecticut, the Snedeker family. Joe Nickel reported that the Snedeker's landlady found the hauntings ridiculous. She further claimed that nobody has experienced anything unusual on the property and that the Snedeckers lived in the house for more than two years before they left. She goes on to say that the Warrens had conducted a seminar as well as charged the public 
essentially insinuating that they had earned money off the case. It's also important to note that the hauntings that mostly occurred around Philip never had an exorcism or nothing of this sort, and yet the hauntings on the property continue. Ray Garten, writer of In a Dark Place, The True Story of a Haunting, who documented the Snedecker case, has a lot to say in a web post he wrote in 1999 about the Warrens. Garten says, I never saw the inside of the house myself, but the family involved, which was going through some serious problems like alcoholism and drug addiction, could not keep their story straight. I became very frustrated. It's hard writing a non-fiction book when all the people involved are telling you different stories. So I went to Ed Warren and told him my problem. He told me not to worry, that the family was crazy. I was shocked. He said, all the people who come to us are crazy. You think sane people would come to us? Just make it up and make it scary. Since then, other writers who have worked with the Warrens have told me the exact same story, but they've done so quietly because they don't want to make any waves with publishers. Furthermore, Ray states, from my time spent with the Warrens, I learned from Ed that their job is not really to investigate so much as it is to take the stories told by these families, most of whom are dealing with real problems like alcoholism, drug addiction, mental illness, and or domestic abuse problems that are buried by their supernatural fantasies, and arrange them into a sellable package that will make a good book, and hopefully a movie. Not only are the Warrens frauds, not only do they give a bad name to people who are seriously investigating paranormal phenomena, I think they are evil because of the way they exploit families already deep in despair. Garten speculated that Ed and Lorraine switched to demons right after The Exorcist became popular, first as a novel and then as a movie. Ed and Lorraine stopped encountering ghosts and began to uncover demon infestations. It seems that wherever they went, people were being sexually molested by demons. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? So that's all of the cases. There was one more part about Lorraine and Ed that I've not mentioned. First, when Lorraine and Ed first started ghost hunting in the very beginning with the whole sketch the house, haunted house scheme, Lorraine didn't expect to see anything. In fact, she claimed to be a skeptic. Now to me, this is a very rare first for a supposed clairvoyant. Actually, there's one more tidbit that just makes all of this worse. In one 1990 incident, Ed Warren allegedly filmed a female spirit that was haunting a cemetery. The thing is, the film was never made public, and the spirit allegedly turned out to be the work of a woman named Judith Penny, who was reportedly wearing a white bedsheet over her head. Judith Penny, Ed's assistant and liaison, Penny asserted that she and Ed Warren had an affair, starting from when she was 15, and that apparently ended just a few years before Ed died in 2006. To make matters worse, Lorraine knew about the affair and was in complete consent with it. Now to be clear, in light of this information, none of this is evidence against Ed and Lorraine's career. I mean, obviously I did just give you mounds of evidence, but let's say I didn't do that. The information about the affair on its own wouldn't mean they have encountered numerous amounts of ghosts and demons in their career. However, if you paint yourself as this pure, religious couple fighting against the demonic hordes of hell, we have this going on in your life, then it should stand to go against your character. In conclusion, the Warrens have clearly demonstrated a pattern of deceit when investigating the paranormal, like Ed telling the fable of the cursed statue of Osiris causing Walter Brian Emery to go into a coma, Ed's ghostly landlady apparition, or the Annabelle doll sneaking up on people to choke them, cause car crashes, and being able to write messages on pieces of paper, or furthering a witch hunt about the innocent Bathsheba Sherman, and claims of Carolyn Perrin's levitation, or creating the ghost boy hoax in Amityville, and 
lies about making the Glatzel family rich, and the ridiculous possession defense, and the possession itself. And of course, there's the Warrens making a profit off of these lies and the lore of the paranormal to further their careers through lectures and book deals. And besides all of them being frauds, they didn't even follow their own code when it comes to dealing with demons. Specifically, the code for that matter would have damned them to hell ironically enough. Just saying. Thank you for watching. If you liked the video, hit the like button. If you want to see more videos like this, subscribe to the channel. Thanks.